everyone. Welcome and thanks for joining us. My name is Brian Miller. I'm the director at Catalyst Contemporary here in Baltimore, Maryland, uh, where Thursday it was 77 and today it was snowing. Uh, sort of describes our city a little bit. Um, thanks for joining us for the uh, second of two talks um, for the group sculpture exhibit titled The Foundations of What? Um, I'm joined today uh, with four more of artists from the show. Uh, Jeff Robertson, Kay Ito, Sebastian Martirania, and Gard Jones. Uh, I'm also behind the scenes here joined by uh, Liz Faust, our gallery manager and curator. Uh, he'll be working all the technical uh, information in the background. Uh, just a few things about Catalyst. Um, this show runs through March 4th, which is next Saturday. Uh, we are having a uh, end of end of show happy hour from three to five. If you'd like to come into Baltimore and join us, um, I, I bet some of the artists will be there and uh, it'd be nice to catch up and see the work if you haven't seen it in person yet. Uh, I did want to let you know about two upcoming, actually three upcoming shows uh, following the foundations of what uh, we have uh, a three person show, it's all charcoal works on paper. Um, it's a fantastic uh, exhibit of artists looking at memory as a geo as uh, the geological sorry the geological characteristics of memory um, and then in the back room gallery we'll have a solo show um, by an artist um, out of Saint Augustine Opan Mexico which is in Southwest Mexico um, he's a self-taught painter uh, he's also a corn farmer and uh, he's telling uh, a traditional tale of uh, Uncle Rabbit in the wax style. It's a similar story to Br'er Rabbit um, through a series of 13 paintings that are exquisitely made on handmade Amate paper. Um, following that in April, we have uh, Sejong Cho and Bonnie Crawford with a dual exhibit. Um, and that's gonna be fantastic as well. Uh, in case you want to follow us online, we're at Catalyst Contemporary on the Instagram and on Facebook, of course, LinkedIn, and uh, on YouTube. We have a YouTube channel, and you can see all of our past artist talks and a few other um, video and audio video productions, uh, including some short films that we've made over the last four years uh, since we've been open. So again, thanks for joining us. I uh, just want to do a brief introduction to the artist. Um, Jeff Robertson uh, is both a, well, all a photography artist, a light artist, and now a uh, sculpture-based artist repurposing materials um, for 3D. Kei Ito is a cameraless photographer who also works in sculpture and installation work. Um, we have Gard Jones working in 3D and 2D object making, and Sebastian Martirania working in stone and marble carving almost exclusively. Um, but he also teaches illustration and his work also often crosses over, um, you know, characteristics of illustration um, and his carving. So thanks gentlemen for joining me today to talk about your work in the show. I thought really quickly, just very briefly, um, if each of you gave us a, a, a description of the piece or pieces that are in the show, like what they are and maybe the origin of them uh, in a brief way. Uh, Jeff, would you mind starting off? Sure. Um, so I have two kind of main sets of pieces in the show. Uh, the first is the pellet and the second is a set of two uh, nests that I just refer to as the nests. And um, both of those things are made entirely from uh, repurposed material that I gathered over my five and a half years of living in Baltimore um, in terms of the, the sets uh, for photography and other installations and things that I was building during that time. And when my wife and I moved to New York City, um, I just thought about what can I do with all this material and used it to uh, build these, these sculptures here. Excellent. Excellent. Um, Kay, do you want to describe the piece in the show? Yeah, sure. Um, I have a piece called Our Looming Ground Zero. Uh, this is actually a part of a much larger installation I did 
at Creative Alliance, uh, which this is only showcasing uh, seven prints here uh, with the plum bob, uh, but original installation actually contain 108 of them. Uh, each um, frame contain one word, uh, which I made from transparency exposing to the sunlight, kind of like my uh, cameraless photography practice, embodying the idea of kind of like an open-ended poetry that each word kind of like relates to each other to create much larger uh, meaning, depending on who look at it. Um, but base the the big base of the idea is this idea of the pandemic and uh, the nuclear weapon of uh, annihilation by the nuclear weapon. Anywhere and any time we like the place you exist could be your looming ground zero. Um, so ground zero could exist anywhere. And that's kind of like a part of the reason that what could be consumed when that new ground zero happens. Uh, so that's mm -hmm. kind of like a, my idea of the show. Or the and, and these say, the things that the things that are the words are things that may be taken away from consumed us. Consumed by the, yeah, consumed yeah. by, by the. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. instead of the ground zero. Yeah. Garb, would you please respond? Sure. Um, this piece is called Lost. Um, it has many levels uh, in it. Uh, I'm not generally inclined to explain my work. Um, where this came from is a curious question. Uh, the, the stone and the rope, I believe, about 10 years ago came together. Uh, I like my materials basically to call me. They come and get me, uh, they draw my attention, and they ask to be brought together in many ways. Uh, and binding the stone was the first step in what has been a 10-year exploration of what has become uh, both mythological uh, and personal um, exploration of self. Um, and so then we have the idea of being bound, uh, and why would one bind a rock? Are you trying to restrain it? Are you trying to protect it? What is a rock? The rock is the earth. The earth is us. We are the rock. And then, you know, in a piece like this, which is literally called Bound and Broken, we, we have the bound stone, and then we have the same material, limestone, that has been carved on a lathe. Uh, and yet, as such, it becomes ornamental, it becomes structural, but it is still fragile, and so it has broken. Um, the, the black glass for me uh, is, is an abyss. It is a void, it is a hole in existence. It is the, the window that we look through darkly. It is um, the, the river Styx. It is the, the absence. Um, there, there's a lot of parallels to um, uh, you know, Plato's allegory of the, of the cave, um, where the, the one slave that escapes from the cave, uh, his only way he's able to understand the world outside the cave is by looking at a reflection. Uh, but I see it as a whole. I see it as an abyss. I see it as the concept of looking into the abyss. The abyss looks back. So we reflect ourselves in our search for ourselves, and yet there is no answer and then, of course, not to be afraid of it. So these things keep coming together. And the, and the bound stone, I, I guess, is the self. It is the heart. It is the mind. It is the soul. It is the spirit. But it, it just keeps finding new platforms uh, by which to explore its existence um, for me. Uh, so is it me? I don't know. Uh, um, I'll leave that to others to try to figure out. Um, so, you know, that's lost, and then you saw Bound and Broken, and then I have a piece hanging on the wall that is a, a drawing for a sculpture, and I use the term drawing for sculpture a little bit loosely, because yes, there's charcoal there, but what you see is a black monolith is actually a museum board that has been, uh, you know, cut into that shape to give the illusion of volume. Uh, the, the stone that you see bound is a, a gicle, that has been mounted onto museum board and then mounted onto that museum board. So anytime I do a drawing, these things become assemblages, they become layered. Um, and as such, um, one might call them assemblages, one might call them wall sculptures, and sometimes they truly are. 
Um, but I always see them as drawings as a way of working out an idea for this would be, you know, a, a 12 to 15 t foot tall piece outdoors. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, of course, the, the base of it is surrounded by um, steel spikes, rusted steel spikes. Um, in this case, another gicle that has been mounted and, and then hand cut to to assemble over the, the charcoal rendering. Fantastic. Um, Sebastian, you want to take a stab at answering that? <laughs> uh, sure. <clears throat> just to describe the piece, I mean, it's, it's pretty simple and it's very specific. It's just um, describe the object itself. It's a piece of stone that came to me through someone whose grandfather found it outside of a basically an old abandoned print shop here in Baltimore. And so it's uh, part of a printing press. And they, of course, asked me if I wanted this piece of stone. And I'm always into that kind of thing. And right around this time, um, the Trump administration had basically sent out a series of memos and meetings and basically advised the CDC and the HHS not to use uh, a group of seven words in their 2019 justifications for federal funding. And so my thinking was, regardless of how you feel about any of these particular words, the idea that this was just like the toe in the pool of trying to control language was very concerning. And the story kind of went in and out of the news very fast. Um, and initially it was kind of overblown in the sense that people said things were like banned, which was kind of cool. they basically just said, you can still use these words, but you're much less likely to get money from the federal government, which is not exactly banning them, but pretty close. So I thought it would be interesting to basically take those words and carve them into this decommissioned printing press part um, in a way that would not only preserve the words, but allow them to be propagated. So as some people experience in the show, you're able to basically put a piece of paper on this in the same way you might on a tombstone and make a rubbing. So the printing press is able to function again. And the words that were, you know, in theory, uh, being taken away can be preserved and, you know, reproduced. Something that happens a lot, like the one thing you start to take away from somebody and then it, it finds a way to creep right back in. <laughs> Oh, right. I mean, there's nothing better for, you know, album sales or book sales than to sure. say it has explicit lyrics or right. tell everybody you're banning it. Yeah. We're going to we're going to cover up part of the cover so you can't see it. <laughs> right. Um, well, thanks for at least um, bringing us uh, closer to the piece, a little, pieces a little bit. Um, I think it helps to know sort of the origin stories a little bit, um, whether they're explicit or or more metaphorical or poetic and broad. Um, I thought I one of the questions I had um, that I, I think is really interesting when you're working with 3D materials um, is how you determine what ter materials to use for a project. Like where where do the where does that idea begin? Um, you know, as as a photographer, I mean, I, I start with photography. I'm starting with the, I'm starting from that point of view. If you're a painter, you may be starting from canvas, but you have so much to choose from. And and actually, part of this show, the foundations of what, in terms of the um, the physical look of the show, there are so many different types of materials in the show, from stone to paper to glass to lighting um, to carbon fibers um, to yarn and thread. So um, I was hoping that we could maybe get an idea is like when you have a concept um, that you want to execute, where do you start in finding the material? Um, Sebastian, I actually think I'll start with you because your, your answer may be a little more straightforward. And I, I want to know if there's some nuance in there that I'm missing. Well, I mean, as it pertains to this piece, again, it was very specific. The piece of stone had found its way to me um prior to the idea but when i had this thought it was like well, of course this is obviously the thing that i'm meant to use for this particular purpose mm -hmm. uh in other cases i'm asked frequently if i see a stone and see something in it um and not necessarily the material is important but 
it's often because the material itself, a lot of the work I do is with salvaged material from various places, primarily here in Baltimore. So the history of the stone and its specific history, not just the history of like stone carving in general, has always had something to do with the concept behind the piece. Whereas earlier in my career, it was more like a necessity. It was, this is what I could afford because this is what I could find. Or this is what I can pull off a building or pull off the street or roll into the head of my pickup truck. Uh-huh. Or this is what someone left at my studio door, which used to happen too. Um, but now it, it developed into something where it's very specific to the idea. The stone that I'm using came from a certain place and it means a certain thing because it came from that place. So it, it's all related. Well, the synchronicity of the concept of the carved words, like that, those words, the power of words, um, and this idea, and the fact that this thing used to be a printer's block, I mean, the synchronicity of that is fantastic. You know, like, what else are you going to use it for? You know what I mean? Like, it's almost like it, it doesn't have another use. It had to be used. No. Uh, <laughs> it had to be used to do that. Yeah, I mean, coincidentally, again, it was someone I knew through various art and work things here in Baltimore, whose father be, was a printer for the U.S. government, for Congress. And wow. it was his father's father who found this stone on the side of the road or the side of the street, um, you know, back in the 60s or 70s and just knew his son, my friend's father, did this, was a printer, thought maybe they would like this thing. And then, it, you know, a father's thoughtfulness for his child was what yeah. brought it into the back of his <laughs> like a small car yeah and then it kind of sat around and bounced between various locations in their family homes for decades until it eventually um found its way to me so thanks joe hope he's watching um Incredible. and not not something light to pick up either i've moved it several times <laughs> it's, it's it's brutally heavy <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah Okay, what about you? What um, you, you your installations? There's so many different types of things. They they all almost always involve um, a part of exposing um, mm-hmm. uh, light cool. uh, chromogenic paper to to something. But the installations have taken on lots of different materiality. So I'm curious about where that where do you start? Sure. Um... It's kind of funny that even though like my recent artwork doesn't really look like a photography as in terms of like what traditional photographer might would make. Uh, it's I always levitate towards to sculpture installation, even the painting. But if, even though all of these things, I always have this fundamental idea of the photography. Like it's almost to the point that deconstructing everything about photography, taking out the camera, taking away the machine, and trying to co- understand what is the most basic fun- fundamental idea of the photography. And it always comes back to light, that this ability to capturing the light. Uh, and that's kind of like what I am start with. Uh, what is like my idea of the photography, which is the idea of the capturing that exact moment right there. Um, <clears throat> and to me, like, that's kind of like a starting point. So, and also, instead of like a materiality of the uh, installation, I always think of as a process as part of my, um, like, focus. Um, so these prints were all made with sunlight, and the exposure time was uh duration of my one breath. So I was simply exposing the, these prints to the sunlight ex- like for the duration of one breath. So it's kind of becoming the performative uh, ritualistic art making. Uh, so like these are essentially the result artifact of my performance. And there I'm kind of like a putting together in order to create this idea of um, <clears throat> the poetry that I was talking about earlier. Uh, and if Liz, if you can go down one more, um, the whole installation was originally lit with one single spotlight on the ground. So if you go step into the space, that your shadow become part of the installation. Uh, so that interactiveness, like instead of like a 
focusing on one single object, I think about the space a lot. How do I activate the space? How do I include the audience? So in the extent, I consider audience as part of the material as well. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and um, what was the other thing I wanted to talk about? Oh, um, not specifically materiality, but uh, and I think I, I think this is something I can talk to uh, Sebastian later. Um, I'm using these as kind of like a mock, uh, mocking, not mocking, but uh, emulating gravestone. So this idea of the imagely, the word, uh, the look of it, even though it's not taken from the original gravestone, I'm trying to imply that this idea of the gravestone that might get consumed by this, the world, you know, um, ending ground zero um so that's kind of like a long and short of like what i think about materiality okay jeff i'm, I'm sure you have a lot to say about this uh the materials yes absolutely i mean this is my first kind of um endeavor when it comes to sculpture and uh there's an old axiom um that I use a lot in, in my previous career um, in product development, but a, a form follows function. I think it was something that was derived with regards to architecture, but I, I find it to be kind of uh, something to think about when, when I look at these particular sculptural pieces where the function was really, how do I get rid of this material that I have accumulated over the course of the past half decade? Um, into something that's that's still has like a, some kind of interesting form, a, a form that is symbolic in nature. Um, and so the materials, like you know, this is the first time again, like I've, I've, I've ever created something like this. The materials were already there; they they came from previous previous projects, previous installations, previous uh, uh, sets that I, that I was doing for photography and it really came down to how do I what do I do with this stuff because I, I didn't want it to go to a landfill I, I would feel terrible about that it's good material um, and so the function here was to come up with something that could compact all of this together to prevent it from going into a landfill and the form kind of followed that function in a way where like can I come up with something that is relatable, something that has a symbolic um, kind of meaning to it uh, in order to kind of provide that function? And the two forms that I came up with were one, the pellet, um, which here, I think an owl or um, you know other kind of bird, they regurgitate material that they've already consumed. Um, my kind of long title for the pellet is an homage to all that has been processed and consumed. And so the material here has been digested. It has been processed and has been packed down into this pellet that is then um, regurgitated and, and presented. And then the nests also were the second kind of form that followed this, this purpose of this function of getting rid of material, but they themselves also have a function. If you think about it from a biological standpoint, um, they provide shelter and housing um, to, to birds. Um, and so, yeah, I'm looking forward to new projects down the, down the road to kind of figure out like where to get materials. I really like the idea of reusing stuff. Um, and so hopefully that, that is a theme that continues. Well, you know, you and I have had several conversations and, um, you know, part of this show, in fact, there was an idea uh, that connects some of the works through recycling and reuse of materials, um, both in in a self-conscious way of finding a solution to not producing waste or doing something with the waste that's useful. Um, you know, and I, I think that's a, a really critical point um, to not only the work that you're doing, but I mean, Sebastian's working with reused materials guards working with natural materials are then brought in. Um, and even the artists who are in the back room, the other artists that are part of the show. Um, so some of our conversation was about that reuse and reconstruction of materials, um, both in a very conscious way, um, but also in like a, like a natural way, like, you know, 
it is natural to reuse and things like that, but we, we have a consumptive society that, that um, actually has, is doing that less and less in a way. And it's very important that we find ways to both first reduce, reuse, and recycle things that we're working with. So, Gar, what about you? Um, in terms of the materiality, in terms of making choices to start, obviously this, the um, rock has become a form or expression or motif that's important that's not done being explored. Um, that's one element that has gained momentum with you but in terms of the other materials, and of course the, the glass too, the black thing, where do you start when you're thinking about a project um, with with what material to come to, to utilize? I, it's a difficult question for me. <laughs> um, Liz did a pretty good job of assessing it as I was chatting with her about how one of my drawings could be take six months to complete because I'm constantly changing it before I finalize it and say, okay, now it's time to move on. This is good enough. Um, um, the, in, in the process, and I will be working on you know, numerous pieces simultaneously, but then I'll walk away from one. And when I'm walking away from it, I haven't forgotten it. It's still living in my head. In fact, many of the things I build, I do to get them out of my head because they'll keep me awake at night. Um, so there, Liz said, well, gosh, it sounds like it's an intuitive process for you. And I think that's about as accurate as anybody has ever been able to um, nail down my process. Be I always say the materials simply talk to me. They call me. Um, I, I will be out on hikes. I will walk alleys. Um, I like to go to scrap yards. And uh, amongst all of the things, the shapes, the forms, the textures, the colors, there'll be that one thing that'll just say, you know, hey, guard over here. And I, I won't be able to get out of my head. And there's been times when I've um, gone back to places and um, either liberated or, or legally acquired something that had been, you know, whispering in my ear the whole time. Um, the, looking for the, the stone, which has become a real steady uh, thing for me, uh, I've gone to quarries and, you know, I don't want to get anybody in trouble and I don't want to get in trouble, you know, um, so I'll, I'll go into the quarry office and I say, you know, listen, I got a hard hat, I got steel toe boots, um, you know, I want to buy a, I want to buy a rock. Yeah. And the guys are like, one? And I'm like, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, but I want to pick it out. And, you know, they scratch their head and I say, just go do it. Just, you know, look, bring me a cup of coffee the next day you come by. And so I'll, I'll, I'll be able to do that. And it's kind of nice to have that kind of freedom just to walk around. And sometimes I'll walk out. I didn't see a rock I liked. Um, and then picking the right rope to bind it with uh, actually is very involved. And a lot of the rocks have been bound. Mm, eight, 10 times before, before the binding is just right. I have to kind of find my way around the rock with the rope. They're not glued, they're not attached. It is, it is the tautness of the binding. Um, and I like to hide how it's connected so that you don't see the loose ends uh, in these pieces. Although the loose ends are starting to appear in some new pieces that you haven't seen yet, Brian. Mm. Um, so there's, there's that. And then, you know, once I, uh, um, begin with the idea of the rock or while I'm tying it up, it'll start talking to me. And I know that sounds a little crazy, but it'll start talking to me about, you know, who am I? Uh, where did I come from? Uh, what am I doing here? Gosh, you know, what is that? Those are the three great questions of existence, right? We all ask ourselves that with everything that we do every day. Um, they're the foundation of who we are as human beings to contemplate our own existence. And I listen to these stones as I tie them up. Um, and they'll tell me, I am lost, you know, in an, on an abyss. And so then I go like, well, how am I going to, you know, take that and make it in a material form that others can see what you're talking about? Um, and I realize it's my unconscious uh, addressing these very questions through the stone. You know, the, uh, don't get me wrong. I don't need a jacket that buttons up the back just yet. The rocks aren't actually talking, but I relate to them. And they're communicating to a part of me. Uh, and then the, the, 
the limestone that has been turned on a lathe. And I have, I think, two dozen of these. I chanced upon them um, and stopped and stared at them for an hour, walked away, came back a month later. They were still there. And this process went on for six months. And finally, I broke down and loaded them up into my truck. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I, they've been finding their way. I didn't know what I wanted to do with them when I got them. They, they, were, they were simply calling my name. Um, but now they're starting to show up as both sculpture and as pedestal. And we, you know, uh, I'm also like Nam June Paik when he first created video art, and like Constantin Brancusi uh, when he first got rid of the pedestal. It, it's uh, the conceptual idea of what a sculpture sits on. To me, you can't pretend the pedestal's not there. Therefore, it has to be integrated into the work. You can't pretend that the frame is not on the painting. So then it has to be a part of the work. You can't pretend that the wall's not there if you're hanging something on the wall. So it has to be a part of the work. Uh, all those things come into play. So um, not only does the stone become the work, but the these broken uh, columns become the work, become the pedestal, the floor becomes a part of it, the wall becomes a part of it. Uh, and then, you know, very much like Kai said, you know, we, we can go all the way back, you know, to the, as far as people made art to begin with, is the, what the viewer completes the creative act by engaging with it. And I think it was until the 60s where we made that primary uh, with performance and installation work where, yeah, you know, the human interaction with the work is is a part of the work, which is why I don't usually explain what do they mean. I, I usually, ask, when people ask me that, I tell them, well, what does it mean to you? you know, what does yeah. a stone mean to you? What does being tied up mean to you? Right. And that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, no, you, I don't think the white jackets, were, you're we're not ready for that quite yet. <laughs> okay. Um, but because uh, working in an intuitive way is certainly different than starting from the concept and, and moving towards something. Um, I think uh, in, intuitive art making has certainly taken a back seat over a long time uh, in the recent art history as um, concepts um, moved art forward for a long time. Um, but there's something to be said about uh, the, in, the intuitive process that's very important. And, 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 and frankly, even though some of you may start with the concept, um, I, I've known all of you for a number of years or even longer now, and there's an intuitive aspect to everything that you are working on. Uh, one of the things that, I, that came up in my thoughts and listening to, to your answers was, um, and because I'm not a sculptor, I've, uh, uh, that there is this constant tension in 3D materials between um, the, the natural thing that you're working with. I'm thinking of, and unfortunately, Alberto Capitolieri couldn't join us. Um, he's in Venezuela today, but I was thinking about like him pouring the concrete box and things that might happen like chips or bubbles. Um, Sebastian, I'm thinking of like, you have this one precious stone that has all this history and meaning. And like, you have this like impending responsibility to make sure that those words are perfect on there. You know, um, the tension K of the plum bobs like hanging over there. I mean, that tension is very important to that. Like that moment, that penultimate moment before something explodes. Um, but they also can swing as the air moves by. Um, Jeff, um, we know about, um, you know, the tension with your work and things coming out and moving out in the pellet and, um, and its weight. Um, and indeed, guard yours, there's this tension with the rock sitting on a beautiful void of black glass. Uh, you know, there's all this amazing um, relationship between the, control of material in in sculpture that is absolutely fascinating and i'm just thinking about that um, while you guys are responding about like ma what materiality means to you in the work um it's just a, an observation on my part um in, in thinking about those things um and, and this can be a long or short answer but um 
are you interested in revealing or hiding the hand in your work? Um, and whatever that might mean to you is something that um, I was thinking about. Um, you know, I, I think about photography, Jeff, I'm looking at the piece behind you. Is this something, one of your pieces? And I'm thinking how photography has this, you know, bent on being um, somewhat removed, like the eye is somewhat removed from what's happening. And and in making the art, it's, it's always like, you know, it's like pristine print and we frame it and do all this beautiful work. Um, and it's almost like the hand isn't there. Um, and of course, all of your work with all of the work in the show is specifically made by hand. So I'm real curious about that. Um, if anybody wants to respond. I'd be happy to jump in on that. Um, I, I think that the, the best art, um, the, the goal is to craft the craft out of it. If the viewer comes to the work of art and all they see is how magnificently crafted it was, it's, it's all about, look what I can do on the part of the artist. Um, and if the craftsmanship is, is weak, then you miss the piece. You're, all you're focusing on how poorly made it was. So it has to live in this void of not being an issue. Mm. Uh, and then yeah. I use the phrase crafting the craft out of it. That would be an awesome t-shirt. I, he <laughs> crafted the craft out of that art. That'd be great. Uh, Jeff and Kay, you also wanted to respond? Jeff, you can go ahead. Uh, sure. Thanks. Um, thinking about the craft aspect of it, and this is going to be, I'll start with the nests. Um, I spent a lot of time watching videos of birds actually making nests uh, in order to figure out how do you go about, I mean, you're, it's weaving, right? And weaving is a craft, but how do you do it in a way that doesn't look like a human did it, that it looks like a bird actually stuck this together? Because if you think about the ergonomics of building this as a bird, you're doing it with your beak, right? You got this little boop little beak that's like, it's like, Jesus, how they, how they are. I have a new found respect for, for birds and, and their, their ability to, um, I mean, I we would say dexterity, but I, I mean, that's for a hand, but for the dexterity that goes along with a beak. Right. Um, and I really tried actually going through and here, like going, maybe this is taking the artist's hand a little bit too literal, um, but using just two fingers to like, start weaving all of this wire uh, the way that I had observed birds doing it. And that lasted about a day. And I finally like had to use both hands to, to, to get it. Cause it's just, it was just too complex. It's too hard. It's too labor intensive because birds are tiny. They can get inside. They can really poke around and, and, and manipulate a piece of, of grass or whatever it is that they're using. Um, but a human can't. And, you know, we got these, these fat fingers that just, make make that kind of very um what's the word i'm looking for very tedious very um i'll think of it in a second but you, you get what i'm getting at yeah. it makes that very hard to do um so i think in this case when it comes to like revealing the artist's hand uh, i i would hope that you wouldn't see my craft but you would see the craft of nature within within the nest itself mm -hmm. The pellet is a different situation because that wouldn't be crafted by a beak, but it'd be crafted by the, the, the gullet of, yeah. um, of the, of the, the bird. Uh, but even there, I was thinking very much about like, how would that compress material into a shape that could be regurgitated if, if the PVC pipe that I was using was the bones of a, of a, of an animal that it had can, uh, at Heaton, how would those be manipulated inside the gullet in order to be compacted together to formulate this very solid, very dense object that could be regurgitated? Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So when we think about photography and, you know, kind of going back to what Brian was saying, like we're trying to eliminate as much, like the, like the best craftsmanship for photographer is to eliminate yourself and just focus on subject. But in many ways, I'm anti-photography in, in a way that I actually try to incorporate as much myself 
in the artwork and as well as trying to get rid of the control like a camera is a capable of like taking one fifty thousand th of the the you know second of the photo it's so precise you can control everything i'm trying to get rid of that and trying to go other way so like when you look at some of my photograph uh including uh our looming ground zero you see different shades of red different shades of like like some prints actually are lifted a little bit so it's uh, hazy some of the prints is almost to the point that you can't really read the words and like to me that's like part of the process because like as i was saying earlier it's the performance it's the the prints itself is not the result of the craftsmanship. It's the prints are result of my performance. So sometimes, like, even though they, they don't consider to be perfect, I embrace that and trying to, like, incorporate that aspect as a, for uh, my project. Uh, sometimes I, you know, since these prints are, you know, place, uh, the transparency were placed on top of the photographic paper in the dark. So I sometimes accidentally flip the transparency. So some of the word is upside down or the reversed, but I embrace that because that to me that is implicates the, the aspect of this process. Mm -hmm. uh, so like very much so I'm a process-based artist. Um, so in that way, I'm kind of unique in this photography world or even like beyond the photography world that kind of like incorporating these aspects and try to reach out to uh, different media and try to bring it into the one space. Well, and I think that that's something that people forget. Uh, you, you're making it very overt the, in what you're saying as mm -hmm. to what is key and central to you is like you mm -hmm. making this, right? And people constantly forget that art is made by someone mm -hmm. and that the performance of making it is as important to you uh, as the end product is for them to view it. Um, uh, I refer back to photography again over and over in the digital age and um, mm -hmm. I don't mean to make this about me but I talk about um, darkroom photographers versus digital you know working on thing and I do both as most people do now um, but uh, there was a push to move people away to, uh, into just the digital realm for quite some time, like a decade. And people were like, what are you, you know, why are you doing this? And, and I would respond that that process for me was important of making, uh, going through steps and doing that because it is a performance and there's a, there's a motion. You can have a performance sitting here at the desk and working on the computer. That's fine. It's not the same thing. And Sebastian there using his physical body to carve out those things and move around an object, Jeff drawing and turning this thing around and jamming things down into the, you know, into the pellet and um, the rest of everybody like physically making the work is very important to the end result. Um, and I think that, that all art is a performance that we don't normally think about in the process. That's kind of why I asked because it's, it's, I think it's a really important part of art making that is often neglected. I mean, you know, when you watch videos of, of artists designing and making work and building it, it's absolutely fascinating. And that, that part is a dance. It's a beautiful dance. Um, Sebastian, I wanted to, I wanted to switch over and um, this is still a little a bit on the same topic. Um, and I wanted to add on to the comment. Um, my question was, do you want your work to be explicit or would you rather that there be room left over for um, more intuitive feelings from the viewer? Um, and I'm thinking about the piece in the show specifically and how the text is so important to it. Um, do you want to, do you think you could connect to that? Well, <clears throat> I think that I do always personally have an idea that is very specific behind each piece that I do. So I think I've kind of always worked that way. And part of it's having a background as an illustrator, there's always something very specific I want to communicate. And so I don't want to put it all of the onus on the viewer to say, you need to make sense of this for me. And I made this thing. 
here it is. You tell me what it means. I have an idea that I'm trying to communicate um, and maybe I'm successful and maybe I'm not. And so then that's on me, but it is a two way street. So with this piece, you know, it's the first thing I've ever done that relied on text because generally speaking, I try not to include text in my work because I think it kind of, it makes it specific at minimum to one language or one culture. So it's not universally understood in the way I think a lot of artwork or sculpture should be. Because if you're putting language in there in one way or the other, you're basically by definition excluding a lot of people. If they don't speak that language or read that language, they are not gonna understand this on the same level. But in this particular case, it was all about the words. So it was kind of an interesting opportunity for me to cross over from a lot of my more institutional work where I've carved thousands and thousands of letters for various institutions, often governmental, um, to move it into a space that I felt was, you know, important personally. Um, so, you know, in that on that level, yeah, I think I always want something to have a very specific idea behind it. Um, you know, as opposed to, again, just letting it be completely open-ended. Yeah, I, that what you said about um, the a, a language barrier is certainly interesting. And I think the fact that you've, the context of the, of the piece, meaning like a person, you, Sebastian, carve these in this very specific um, stone block to, to show people something, um, gives it a lot of power. And now those words, in fact, have lots of power. Um, as we talked about earlier, me, just merely by trying to take them away, they became empowered even more so. Um, and you've not memorialized them like as in a, in a grave piece, but um, you've commemorated them uh, through the carving. And that, that, that was a very explicit act on your part. Do you agree? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it kind of goes back in a way in terms of the act to what Kay said somewhat earlier when he mentioned being a process-based artist in my head, I for a split second incorrectly thought, well, is there any other kind? But then of course there is, there are, there are many artists, in fact, probably the top selling artists in the world right now, in many cases are not making their own work. So I think it's actually a really astute comment to make that, yeah, am I a process-based artist? Basically, yes, the vast majority of the experience is something that happens before any kind of show. Mm -hmm. And so I think that is part of something that it really can't be divorced from the piece. Um, it's both the idea of bringing, I think, uh, the potential viewer to the piece from where they are. So some people will look at a piece of artwork and think, oh, well, it's all concept. I'm, I'm not an art person. I don't like that kind of thing. And then some other people on the other end of the spectrum will look at a piece of artwork and think, oh, well, that's all just craft and virtuosity. And I'm not really into that. And they're just showing off what they can do. And I think that it's important to have both aspects working simultaneously. So hopefully you're bringing both of those people into the same place. Um, you know, so the same kind of person or different people can appreciate that work, whether or not they have a, you know, a master's degree in art history or have absolutely no interest in art whatsoever from an academic, you know, perspective. They can appreciate right. one of those levels. Would uh, uh, the rest of you like to respond to that about the this idea of um, wanting your work to be explicit or leaving more intuitive room for its experience? Car? Uh, the I really uh, completely agree with both Kai and Sebastian and Jeff on this matter, there's, when one is focused purely on executing a concept, uh, it isn't, and I've spent many decades doing conceptual pieces that were political in orientation, but if you send it to a fabricator, you get back what you sketched out, what you planned. The discovery of getting your hands dirty, you know, busting your knuckles, breaking a sweat, you know, breaking a bone uh, to build a piece is um, a visceral experience that can't be replaced. I mean, I've worked many years in steel pieces and things happen when you bend, rip, tear, heat, steel. A color changes for one thing. 
And sometimes you like the rust, but if you have a fabricator simply executing a clean idea, you've missed a tremendous opportunity for that visceral experience, I think. And in that um, visceralness, the, you know, the physicality of it, um, I, I think, I think you actually respond. I think you answer, answered the question a few minutes ago, we were talking just like you want people to, I mean, you're there, you've presented the work. You're like, I'm, I'm here, I'm done this. I've done my part. Yeah. Um, that intuitive side you want them to connect with. I think, I think that's, I mean, for me in your work, there is an intuitive side because you're, you're leading people somewhere yeah. without taking them there. And then you let them, get there on their own. Um, there was a, a recent article in, in Be More Art uh, about our show, and um, they were talking about your piece, and it was the first piece that the, that the writer walked into and it drew her down. She said she literally got down on the floor and it pulled her in. <laughs> that's great. You know, it pulled her in, and I think that's the kind of intuitive response that people want. Liz and I had a, a really long conversation about this in the gallery one afternoon. Um, and I explained to her that every single one of my undergraduate professors was a conceptualist from the fiber artist to the jeweler, to the painter, the sculptor, the ceramicist, they were all conceptualists. And one of my great takeaways from one particular professor who became an inspiration for my entire life as an artist was that the work has to speak for itself. If you're, you know, you think about it, if you have to stand next to your piece and tell people what you want them to see in it as the same thing that you saw in it, well, it, it, it's going to be a challenge. At some point, you're going to be dead. And that piece hopefully will still be around. So it carries on then a life beyond you. Uh, and I think that th that's really where the magic happens. Every thing in this world doesn't stay static, uh, except for the beauty of the materials and the forms. Um, so those formal properties of a work of art carry a mystery and communicate. We don't look at Stonehenge the way that people had created it for um, any more than we look at Michelangelo's David for the same reasons it was made. Uh, these things carry on a new life and the artist isn't there to tell us what to think. Uh, the work reaches out and shares a experience that taps into the the root of the human experience that we all do share and then when it's really successful it lives a life past the artist yeah yeah um i, I kind of wanted to uh shift over Kay, I have a, a quick question for you. Um, it's certainly a question I, I would have loved to ask to Alberto if he could have joined us this evening. Um, and it goes back to what I was talking about with Sebastian uh, about balancing the power of words mm -hmm. um, with the other elements in your piece. And I'm thinking about the uh, I'm thinking about Alberto's work, which are literally just poured concrete blocks they're like perfunctory objects mm -hmm. they're building blocks they're banal they're dull gray but the power of those words that are that are uh embossed into them liz i don't know if you have a, a picture of them um brings up so many feelings for people and um how do you balance the power of words uh, sebastian talked a little bit about it i mean it, it was totally about the word Mm -hmm. um, how do you balance the rest of the elements in the piece? It's a, it's a tough one. Um, it, this is probably the second piece I've made that majority of the aesthetic has actually word. Uh, like till this point, I have been haven't even really using any archival footage or anything. I've just just experimenting with photographic element and use of the light to create kind of like a light draw drawing in a way. But these are one of the first project I started experimenting with Word. Uh, even though I wasn't publishing as part of my artwork, I do do a lot of poetry um, just for myself. And usually these poetry are short 
it doesn't really make sense for anyone else but to myself. Uh, it's because I kind of like a kind of person who make a connection to certain thing that people usually don't make a connection to. So like I, I really love the idea of this. If people like 10 different people exist in this room seeing the same artwork would have a different kind of connection and i actually did explore more of the aspect with uh, my recent show at the stamp gallery called um uh, teach me how to love this world uh there i was using two slide projector each containing 80 slides one has a pronoun and that one has a noun and kind of like a rotates to create endless poetry of combination of the words such as their war my sacrifice your love their so on and on and e each time it passes it, it's kind of like a creates a different meaning and by the person who's looking at it it changes the meaning so uh, I, I know it's like not exactly answering your question per se I'm just trying, trying to talk about more but like oh yeah there you go um, talk about more but like how I consider a word uh, I never really use except for the uh, the one I use like archival document I kind of like I use like a more open-ended um, statement but always so I don't know um, yeah I, I guess like my answer is like I'm still in process of trying to find a balance between these two uh, and like it's kind of interesting to coming from a uh, originally photographer because photography is always always about just a visual rarely about and trying to try not to describe everything you know one photograph should tell every single story that you should know and like that in in, in my case like I don't think that's possible <laughs> um so like I, I am trying to, I guess, like uh, branching out to the new way to explore um, my idea and trying to combine um, some of my poetry aspect of my artwork, which is poetry is a really a performance and, you know, kind of also connected to these poetry doesn't co doesn't get completed without the audience because they are the one who makes the connection between these words. Mm -hmm. um, did they answer your question? <laughs> In yeah, <some> <laughs> you, you answered it. Yeah, uh, you know, I think it. I think it's. Um, I think there's a, the reason I'm asking because there's a difficulty in using words. It really is um, mm -hmm. as part of your artwork because you know, uh, as a fairly literate people coming into the gallery, they're they're going to focus on them. And mm -hmm. as we already seen with Sebastian's work, there's power pretty intense power in words. And so um, it, it's not the, rather than just putting those words up there, which even in the slide projector images that uh, Liz just showed, um, there's also sound and smell going mm -hmm. on with the projectors going. So it's, mm -hmm. there's, there's a more dynamic experience going on too. Right. Um, so, you know, how do you balance out like the bobs? This is just rhetorical, okay? I'm just saying like, there is this interesting um, play that you have to deal with rather than just saying, well, I'm just going to put these words up on the wall and have people respond to them. It's kind of funny. Uh, just a quick, res like just a super quick response to that. Uh, I usually can't make artwork unless I know where I'm putting my artwork at. So like the, the location, the history of the location, usually, or just the how much of the light I have, I can have a control usually like determines a scale of the piece and influence a lot within the process of the making. So I'm kind of like, it's a curse and blessing in the same time. Cause like it's a curse. Cause like I, when I'm like, Oh, I just need to make artwork just without having any, like a, the place I can place at. I, I just get lost sometime. So it's kind of interesting. I need to think about what, what kind of audience, what kind of space, in order to kind of like a place these things in my head in order to determine certain aspect of the artwork, um, if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, there's a question I wanna to pose to, to all of you. Um, you know, the show itself and the concept uh, of the show is that all the artists are really questioning 
some ground that we stand on <laughs> in a way. Um, and that was sort of like the, the title, the foundations of what, what became this like literal geographical locations, like a new place almost. And, and um, where we're questioning so many things, which is a, you know, our, our world is under serious question mark right now in terms of everything that we're understanding. Um, and I actually liked how there is quite a variety of pieces in the show. In the back room, there's a lot more like color and vibrancy in the show, but the issues that people are considering um, are just as um, um, prescient as the ones that you four and Alberto are dealing with. And the thing is the front room, there's a little bit more of a, like a solemn feeling um, to the work. And I wanted to know, um, I kind of just wanted to put that out there as a discussion point and feel, see if you're feeling the same way about the work. I mean, I'm thinking about Sebastian, you have this work that's um, really addressing socio-political and specifically government issues and control very directly. Um, Jeff, you're talking about environmental, environmental issues, nature, um, uh, recycling, you know, you know, our consumptive qualities, um, okay, you're talking about absolute, you know, nuclear annihilation. I mean, all this stuff, uh, guard, your, your work just feels like, like deep, heavy when I look at it. Like, I mean, um, not in an oppressive way, but there's something very, um, like when, when the, when the apes find the monolith in 2001, they're like blown away. They're like, ah, it, it's scary, but enticing. So there's this weight to a lot of the work. And I, I just was hoping that um you guys could respond to like my feeling of that that's like my into my intuitive response to the work in the front room um i wondered if you guys could kind of start off with that jeff do you want to respond first sure um you know a theme within my pieces of course is like our influence on ecology biology the world around us but something that's kind of interesting that if you watch a lot of nature documentaries, as I do, is, is a lot of times animals are able to, it sounds crazy, but benefit from some of our, our, our doings to the world. Like, and there's, I find that kind of humorous because like, I, I don't know how often that occurs, you know, in, in the, in the animal kingdom, but it does seem intriguing that a bird could create a more sounding habitat for itself or our or home out of our waste, right? Um, and you do see that a lot in the, in the many bird nest building videos that I watch, like they'll pick up just like trash bags and they'll pick up other things that they found around and, and use Ribbons it in the weaving. And all yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And whether or not that's good or bad, like I, I'm not sure, um, but it's just kind of an interesting thought about like how much we influence their their world um and then there's also the, the sad thoughts of like you know you think about whales with plastic bags in their stomach right and, and you look at the pellet and think about like you know this this plastic pvc material that you know, this could have just gone to a landfill but like the idea of that being stuck in the throat of a of a biological creature um it's very kind of, it's just very depressing. Um, so yeah, hopefully that answered <laughs> what you're going for. Well, yeah, I mean, I guess I'm looking in a sense, I'm looking for you gentlemen to either like legitimize what I'm sensing or say, no, that's not what it's about. I think, yeah. I, I think that's like, it's not exactly like it's like every piece is about death, but it's more like idea of contemplation of the life. I, I see a lot of theme connected within all of the artwork, especially this ref idea of the reflection, what God was saying, like, you know, this idea of only way to contemplate one's life is to see your own reflection and kind of like this idea of creating this meditative space that uh, art sometimes can create. Uh, and I think like all of the artwork we have in the gallery kind of does that, this idea of 
seeing this like existence of like that right moment in the gallery looking at the artwork can inform the life that there is right now for that person uh in a way it's kind of really self-reflective and i think there's a lot in my artwork this I, I make a lot of work about death and like annihilation and stuff like that but i never really consider they as a devastating fact in, in, in i mean they are but in fact you can't appreciate life without like acknowledging of the death or acknowledging of existing of at the side they are the two same thing on the same you know two different thing on the same coin so to me like I, I don't exactly didn't feel the idea of like this sadness or anything from the front room but rather like I was kind of like a con you know, cont contemplative and kind of like a recognizing like oh wow like you know like makes me feel more alive in a way uh, but maybe I'm just odd. <laughs> well, and no, but your your work is your work is very much so about the warning and the value of life. Your your work mm -hmm. is totally about the value of life, and you're just warning everybody like, don't be screwing around with those big red buttons. Yep. You know, history or history repeats, but it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to. Yeah. Guard, you wanna um, you wanna jump in there? Sure. Um have a little more mileage than these other three um, artists in the room um, and spent a good chunk of those miles looking at the world and looking at the stupid decisions that human beings make and what appears to be uh, irrevocable harm. Um, and to kind of segue, when the World Trade Center came down um, on 9-11, I was deeply obsessed with the teachings of Joseph Campbell, who the foremost authority, he's gone now, but he was the foremost authority on mythology. And when the, the Twin Towers came down, I couldn't help get out of my head something that he had said in one of his lectures is that if you want to understand what a people value most, look for their grandest and most opulent buildings. It broke me to put the two together that Osama bin Laden understood Western culture so deeply as to take down our temples to money. And I spent about 10 years then making conceptually political work that related to Western culture's obsession with money as its only true worth, its only true value. And then my life crashed and I stopped looking out. I stopped, I mean, don't get me wrong. I, uh, um, Jeff, don't get me wrong for a minute. I grew up in the Pacific Northwest. That's God's country. You want to touch God, you go for a hike on the Cascade Mountain Range, and you'll know what that's about. But I stopped looking out for answers, and I started looking in, recognizing that as a human being, I carry with me the whole history of all these mistakes that we've always made since the beginning of um, the monkeys and, you know, taking a bone and killing another animal with it. Uh, and when we discovered fire, which then drove me to, you know, mythology and the, the story of Prometheus stealing fire and what happened to him, which drove me back to mythology, which then drove me to philosophy, which uh, drove me uh, on and on and on to this inward search of who are we really? And uh, I, again, I, instead of looking out for those answers, I looked in and my love of materials and the physicality of materials then manifest it in the work that you see now. Uh, so to Kai, you know, bringing up this idea of, uh, well, what is life? It is absolutely the yin and the yang. You can't have a joy of life, the joie de vivre, without recognizing how short it's going to be. Uh, in the grand scheme of things, we're here that long, and to not breathe it deeply is a mistake. But do not fear the end of it at the same time. You know, I will cast my picnic blanket on the precipice 
and turn my back to the end. I mean, I love Zorba the Greek because of it's a dance of life that ends in death. And then again, like Kai said, it makes you it makes the life all much more sweet because of it. So, you know, the river sticks and the themes of the river sticks, the, the monolith, the, the broken stone, the bound stone, Prometheus, I mean, you know, Odysseus being tied to the mast, all these things just collide together and say, this is the, the core of who we are. Flawed, imperfect, and only here for a short time. Well, and that's the mythology that we all embrace, right? I mean, yeah. that's part of Campbell's thing is like we're always in, we're always involved with some mythology that's been before, some archetype that we embody. We um, just keep doing it. We just keep doing it. You can't yeah. escape it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's not that you have a yeah, – this is super philosophical, but it's not that you have a destiny, but you, you certainly fall into like uh, some sort of mold and you have this path that you are able to go through. And that's what the idea of mythology is that you that the we keep going through these we keep experiencing these things as human beings. Um, it's it, part it, of the the this idea of consciousness that we're um, both burdened and excited about. One of my close associates is a PhD in philosophy, focus on ethics, and at least once a week, sometimes twice a week, I plop down in his office and we we just start talking about you know these things and you know I, I brought up you know Plato's uh, allegory of the cave and I to him and started talking about the idea of not accepting what the truth is and when being exposed with it to reject it to be pained by it to only be able to understand the truth through a reflection of it to come back and try to share it with others and be killed for it that I looked at that reflecting pool that that slave and that story looked at. And suddenly to me, I saw that as, you know, the abyss. We looked into the abyss, the abyss looked back. But I also saw it as the mythology of Narcissus. You know, he drowns in the contemplation of his own existence. It's not a vanity as much as becoming completely absorbed and lost in it. And all these things, there are no answers. I mean, what philosophy, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm on my soapbox, but philosophy is a pursuit for truth and a realization there is no such thing. That's life. And I think that art is the same. Like I, yeah. art is all about question proposing or, you know, exploring the question. We never might not reach the conclusion, but yeah. we try to ideologically try to pursue, but we never probably reach. Yeah. <laughs> So that's why we keep making more stuff because the last one didn't do it for us. <laughs> Sebastian, I'm going to give you the um, the honor or onus of wrapping up those thoughts in terms of the work and the show. Um, you know, being approached with this uh, concept, and again, this is a this is my subjective thing. Um, there's a solemnness and, and Kay, I didn't, um, mean that it was all about death or anything. So being solemn is like that quiet looking at something like trying to observe it, take it in, but also noting that there is, there is emotion and, and, uh, uh emotional connectivity. Um, Sebastian, do you want to kind of wrap up for us, um, in terms of your piece or work in general? Um, cause I feel like your work, uh, at least the work that we've we've been looking at over the last few years together um, has been a very personal reaction to the world uh, in a lot of ways. And um, it is solemn. It, it, it does bring us to certain realizations in a way. And so, um, you know, I'd like to give you that sort of like conclusive comments. Well, I don't know if I can braid all of these loose ends together, um, but I'll try in the sense of, the idea that we're repeating all these things over and over, I, you know, Mark Twain pretty accurately said that history doesn't necessarily repeat itself, but it does tend to rhyme. And I think that is a, basically implying that we have some level of agency with these things. So as mm -hmm. you're kind of asking mm -hmm. us, or we're bringing up the idea of questioning and, you know, making artwork that questions and all this artwork that questions. And I've been kind of hearing that from artists since I was in grad school in particular, the idea that you know, this piece of work questions this thing. 
you know, and maybe it, again, it's in my part of my interest of having some level of specificity to the work, but I guess I've kind of felt since I was in graduate school that the idea of saying just this is a work about questioning these things. It's not to say that questioning isn't important, but I think it's just equally as important to not necessarily say you know the answer, but to have a stake in that thing and say you have an opinion. And often the work that's questioning something, well, the fact that you're questioning this thing at all implies that you do have an opinion on that thing. And so I think, you know, maybe if we consider art both with and without language in it is an avenue to kind of reach people on levels they might not otherwise address a particular issue, it's worth it to kind of, you know, take a stand on these things, to have an opinion and go beyond just saying, I'm questioning this thing. I've questioned this thing and this is what I think about it. What do you think back at me? Um, and so I think that's to some degree, maybe, you know, where I, I hope that my work moves um or at least moves in that direction i'm again speaking only for myself but that's the experience that i've had with a lot of pieces but in particular this one where every time it's shown or posted or ends up somewhere i get one of pretty much two reactions either people that are in support of this thing and want to know where they can get prints or do something like that or people that are very morally opposed um but not so much thinking about the idea behind the piece but just what's on the surface of it so uh, again, I think it's it's worth doing going beyond just the saying I have a question about this thing, but I have a stance. Uh, hundred percent, hundred percent agreement. And I I feel like um, the work in this show does move people towards something. I think you can never, as an artist, like get them all the way there because it's just impossible to like get like a whole group of people to look at that same thing and, and say, yes, this is it. Um, but I feel like everyone does have a stake uh, in the work and that's what's made the work in the foundations of what's so strong and, and come together to be connected as, 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 as anyone who's been to the show or takes a look at our website or feed or comes in after they've heard this talk and see the show, the work is fairly diverse. Um, but all the work brings people to a point of um, consideration and hopefully you hope that they then feel like they then have a stake in something as well. And um, I mean, kudos to the power of art to be able to even move people in that direction um, to make a decision about uh, subjects that are affecting humanity constantly. Um, so look, I wanted to wrap up gentlemen. I feel like, I feel like we could sit here and keep talking and, and go on. Um, and I'm sure we will have individual conversations later on down the road, but I want to thank you all and thank all the artists who have been a part of the foundations of what, um, for participating and sharing your ideas. Um, this talk's been fantastic. Um, for those watching, if you want to learn more, as I mentioned, we're online and all those key, key social group, social media groups, but please come in if you're in the area to come see the show in person and see the physicality and have a physical reaction to it as well. Um, gentlemen, have a great night. Thanks for participating and uh, we'll see everybody soon. Take care.